So maybe I should start. All right, so, uh, so this is a third lecture uh, on the mathematical theory of black holes. So I, I uh, discussed uh, this so-called tests of reality uh, for black holes, which were uh, to do with rigidity, uh, then uh, stability and collapse. So they, they all have to do, so rigidity is, is a statement, so they are all statements in fact about the Einstein equations in vacuum. Rigidity is a statement about, uh, about uh, uh, the fact that uh, stationary solutions, so one looks at stationary solutions of the uh, Einstein equations. So in, in the asymptotically flat regime, uh, so we, we are interested in, in uh, space times which are asymptotically flat, uh, stationary uh, solutions, and of course we find this explicit family of solutions, which is called the Kerr family, and uh, uh, then the questions are, here, if there are other stationary solutions besides the Kerr family, stability is something about the stability of the Kerr relative to small perturbations, and the collapse is the issue of how <coughs> you can actually form this kind of stationary solution through, uh, through the mechanism of collapse. In other words, you start with initial conditions. So everything here can be <coughs> viewed from the point of view of the initial value formulation. So you start with initial data, P0, K0, verifying the constraint equations, and, uh, and uh, you, uh, in the case of stability, you are interested in making small perturbations of a care solution, right? So initial data being the, the one of care, and you, want, you wonder <coughs> whether the perturbations will will destroy the, the original care solution. And of course the issue of collapse is that, again, you start with some initial data which are free of trap surfaces and you form a trap surface in the future. And as we discussed last time, trap surfaces are a very good substitute for black holes. If you have, uh, if you have a trap surface, you will almost certainly have a, a, a also a black hole. All right, so uh, anyway, so this, these are the things which I did before. And then I started to talk about, uh, uh, <coughs> so I, I talked a little bit about rigidity, and now uh, we're talking about stability. So, uh, uh, so this is a, a conjecture, stability of the external care. Uh, so again, you see, you see here uh, the care solution. This is the external part of the care <coughs> solution, right? Starting uh, at the event horizon, so R equal R plus is the event horizon, which is the boundary of the black hole region. It's a black hole. And uh, thi this uh, conjecture is, uh, is interesting only in the outside of the black hole. So in other words, you start up with a care uh, you take a space-like hypersurface, you look at the restriction of the care on uh, the space-like hypersurface, uh, that will give you an initial data set. You make a per small perturbation of it, in other words, you change the initial data set by a little bit, and uh, you look at the evolution, and the conjecture is that uh, the evolution will converge to another care solution. Right? So you are starting uh, with the original A and M, care and you get a new one at the end. There will be two care solutions at the end? No, at the end, just one. So, the, you, in other words, you have started with something here, right? But at the end, you are going to get a different one. So, it's not going to be the same care, right? So, the, the horizon will change a little bit, it will not be the same horizon and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so, uh, Right, so this is a statement I made uh, last time, 
which I think uh, Slava was not happy with it, so I made it a little bit more clear. So uh, uh, what I'm saying here is that, uh, sorry, this, this was not the statement actually, this was fine. Uh, I meant that, uh, okay, so these were, uh, these were results uh, which we'll discuss later on in more detail, so I'm not going to get into it. Uh, and uh, I said that uh, lack of exponentially growing modes is not enough to conclude anything about the nonlinear stability. And of course, as an example, I mentioned the emergence of black holes or the emergence of, uh, of turbulence. I'll say more about this later on. I'll, uh, we talk about the care solution, of course, again, you see the explicit solution, uh, the fact that it's stationary and axisymmetric, it's very explicit. Uh, in the case when the parameter a is equal to zero, you get Schwarzschild. Uh, here is again the, the way the care solution looks like. And I mentioned that uh, there are important things to remember. First of all, the values of R, the, there are interesting values of R, which uh, give you when exactly when R plus is a solution of this delta equal to zero, you get the horizon. Uh, then uh, R larger than R plus is the exterior, R less than R plus is the interior of the black hole, R equal to infinity is this, uh, uh, this boundary at infinity. Okay? So this is done by a conformal compactification. Uh, okay, so... And R minus doesn't appear? And R minus doesn't appear here because it's something that has to do with the interior of the black hole. So you see it's, it's, it's here. Right. So, of course, there are lots of interesting things to be t said about the interior, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay, so again, here you see the exterior in more detail. Uh, you see, uh, again, the horizon, right? Uh, and uh, the sky, which is uh, infinity, the null infinity. Uh, you see the, the vector field T, which corresponds to stationarity. So this is in, in those coordinates, uh, Boer linguist coordinates, it's exactly D over DT. Uh, and you see what happens here is that as you approach the horizon, T actually uh, becomes space-like. And this leads to all sorts of, uh, all sorts of uh, phenomena, both physical and, uh, and mathematical. Another thing that... Uh, uh, I mentioned last time, and I'll mention again in, later on, is the presence of trapped null geodesics. In other words, geodesics that uh, a typical geodesic, a typical null geodesic, uh, in this picture will be at 45 degrees and is moving either towards infinity or it's moving in the black hole. In both cases, you are not going to see them anymore, right? So if it moves in the black hole, it will never come back. If it moves at infinity, it never uh, comes back either. So, uh, so those are uh, good in some sense. The, unfortunately, there are some other ones uh, which are called trapped null geodesics and which sit here uh, for all time. So they sit in a region of bounded R for all time. So they don't go to infinity and they don't go to the black hole and they lead to all sorts of issues that have to do with, that can be seen already from the point of view of, uh, of uh, so the region R3, less than 3, I mean the Schwarzschild. Right, so in Schwarzschild, it's exactly R equals 3M, right? So uh, in, in Schwarzschild, it will be a, a hypersurface R equals 3M, which is uh, here. Uh, but in uh, care, it's a little bit more complicated. So you can have, a, you can have many trapped null geodesics in an entire region of uh, R. Okay, anyway, so let's... Uh, so, okay, and then I, I mentioned, and maybe I'll repeat very fast, I mentioned a general discussion about, about uh, stability. We have... Uh, uh, a non-linear equation, so we have some stationary solution which is phi zero and we perturb it. Uh, orbital stability we discussed that is the situation where the perturbation stays small for all time. Asymptotic stability means that the perturbation actually is going to zero, right? Linearized equations we discussed uh, when you when you look at the first term in the expansion, so you look at the essentially what is called Frechet derivative of n, Applied to Psi, this is a linear equation, linearized around phi zero. And, uh, and then again, you can have all sorts of uh, discussions about mod stability, boundedness, and quantitative decay. Mod stability, 
is, for example, the statement that there are no exponentially growing modes that had to do with uh, decomposing the linearized equation, the solutions of the linearized equation, decompo decomposing them into modes in, in some kind of eigenvalue expansion. Uh, and then you can show for every mode, you can show that you have stability. In other words, you can show that they, the, the modes don't grow, right? Uh, they don't become, for example, exponentially growing. Uh, then uh, uh, just having no growing modes does not even imply boundedness. In other words, you can have no growing modes for Psi, and yet Psi doesn't stay bounded for all time. And that will, of course, create l huge problems from the point of view of nonlinear stability. Uh, to prove nonlinear stability, you need what is called quantitative decay, and I'll, I'll explain that uh, later on uh, in more, more explicitly. Okay, so uh, then uh, we looked at the possibility that there, are, there exists a family of stationary states around phi zero. So phi zero is, is, is just one among many, a continuum, in fact, of stationary solutions. And then, uh, then uh, we saw that uh, at a linearized level, d over d lambda of phi lambda, uh, evaluated lambda equal to zero, is actually an eigenfunction corresponding to zero eigenvalue. The same thing happens if you look at diffeomorphism, which keep the equations invariant. In other words, uh, psi lambda, if phi zero is a solution, phi zero of psi lambda is also a solution. Again, you differentiate and you get a huge kernel uh, as a consequence. So this is what we discussed last time. Now, uh, okay, so this I'm not going to repeat. Uh, right. So to prove nonlinear stability, you have to do uh, many things. But in particular, uh, you have to really understand uh, gauges. In other words, you have to, you, you, this deformo the fact that the deformorphism uh, the, the, the fact that an equation is invariant under the diffeomorphism leads to, leads to uh, the need to actually find the correct diffeomorphism, right? So that's one issue. Final state, you have to find the correct final state. <coughs> and this can only be done dynamically, right? And anyway, we'll discuss about uh, this again later on. All right, so, so this is a uh, care stability. Now, uh, in the case of the actual Einstein equation, so I discussed that the issue in general, in the case of the Einstein equation, uh, you can see that uh, the linear <coughs> Einstein equations, of course, are rich equal to zero. If you linearize around a stationary solution, which depends, in other words, a care, which depends on these two parameters, uh, then uh, you, so these are the linearized equations, and you see that the derivative of G with respect to M, in other words, if you vary the parameter M, you get a whole family of uh, eigenstates corresponding to zero eigenvalue and the same thing if you differentiate with respect to A. So you get a two-parameter family of solutions and uh, if you also look at the, dif the fact that the Einstein equations are diffeomorphism invariant, in, the, in other words invariant relative to any diffeomorphism, uh, then you also see that you have a huge kernel uh, which corresponds to that. The full dimension of the kernel is four times infinity plus two. Uh, okay, so now let, let me start talking a little bit, uh, let's, let me be a little bit more concrete and start talking about, va va uh, uh, about the geometric framework that one needs in order to uh, understand this problem. Okay, so to start with, and I mentioned this earlier, it's uh, in, in, uh, in general relativity, or in Lorentzian geometry more generally, but certainly in general relativity, the directions which are important are null directions. So they are important, why? Because they correspond to null geodesics and uh, because, because most of the energy is transmitted along null geodesics, right? So, so null geodesics are supposed to be much more important than, say, time-like directions, right? Especially from the point of view of stability, uh, it's extremely important to, to uh, follow somehow uh, the, the way uh, waves, uh, the, the decay of waves, for example, is very much dependent on the behavior along null directions. All right, so null directions are very important. So because of this, when you talk about frames, you start with two, null, two such null directions, E3 and E4, they are both null, and you also take G of E3, E4 to be equal to minus two. Okay, so in other words, you normalize the frame. Okay, now, uh, once I have, once I pick up a frame, I, mean, I should say not a frame, but a null pair. Once I pick up a null pair, 
I can take the orthogonal complement to the null pair. So at every point, I'm talking about something at every point. So at every point, I'm going to have, I'm going to have uh, a distribution, if you want, right? So at every point p, I take uh, the space perpendicular to these two. If I am in four dimensions, this is a two-dimensional plane. So it's a two-dimensional plane at every point, which is of course space-like. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what I call a horizontal structure. So this is a horizontal structure. Now, this horizontal structure can be integrable or it may not. So if it's integrable, typically if it's integrable, it might generate uh, two surfaces. Like, for example, if you, if you deal, uh, uh, if you look at the intersection between two null cones, an alcohol going this way and an alcohol this going this way, then at every point at the intersection you have a two surface and you have automatically a natural null pair which is given by this. So one which is tangent to this null hypersurface and the other one which is tangent to this null hypersurface. So a very natural way to define foliations is to take the intersection between, between uh, a null hypersurface and another one, or the intersection between a null hypersurface and, say, a space-like hypersurface. That will also give you an intersection, and again, you can talk about a, fr a vector going this way and another vector going this way, which is, uh, they are both orthogonal to these two surfaces. So anyway, uh, what I wanted to say is that this horizontal structure can be integrable or non-integrable. And we'll see examples of both. Okay, once you have, uh, once you, you, you have uh, uh, this horizontal structure, I can also take in the, in the space perpendicular to this, I can take vectors E1 and E2, which are perpendicular to both of them, so they are in the horizontal structure. And uh, I can, so they will be perpendicular to these two, and I also, let's call this Ea. A is one or two, and I'm going to assume that G of uh, Ea, Eb is delta Eb. Okay, so this is again a normalization that I pick, uh, and uh, as a consequence, I get what it's called now a null frame. So a null frame consists of uh, this uh, pair of E three, E four, and then these other vectors uh, Ea. Here I wrote it with capital A, but there I wrote it with little a, doesn't matter. Okay. All right, so now once you have the frame, we do what's done always in geometry. Uh, you look at the uh, connection coefficients. Connection coefficients. All right. Okay, so uh, how do you define the connection coefficients? Well, typically, you take the derivative, the covariant derivative with respect to, say, E alpha. So E alpha can be E1, E2, E3, and E4, right? So alpha, in, in other words, stands for this indices. And I take DE alpha of uh, E beta, uh, and then another one, E gamma. I take G of this, right? So this is a vector field. And I, I pair it with another vector field, and this is what it's called uh, the coefficient gamma, uh, beta, uh, and then alpha gamma, or gamma alpha actually. Right? Christopher symbols. So these are Christopher symbols. All right, so the, the, you get the Christopher symbols. In this, in this particular case, when you talk about null frames, uh, you can. Uh, identify various Christopher symbols. So this is something quite different from Riemannian geometry, where typically in Riemannian geometry, the, uh, all directions are the same. So it doesn't matter too much. Uh, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to identify specific, uh, uh, specific connection coefficients typically. But here you do. And uh, so let me write down some, which are uh, extremely important. So for example, if I look at if, if I look at this, uh, say, E4, if I look at E4, which is a, a null vector, and I take, uh, I take uh, say, 
uh, EA. Okay, so I, I take the EA is in this direction. So this is, uh, remember, A is 1 or 2. So if I take EA of E4 and then EB, so again EB is like the same, B is 1 or 2. So this is, uh, this is a connection coefficient, as you see here, which is called chi AB. It's, it's called a null second fundamental form because typically uh, whenever you have a two surface, in other words, if this uh, uh, distribution here is integrable and it corresponds to a two surface, then this is uh, uh, now second fundamental form in the, I mean, it's a second fundamental form in the usual sense and it's null because it corresponds to an E4. So I can do the same thing uh, symmetrically, I can do the same thing with E3, and then I get what is called kappa bar AB, right? And again, so this is the null second fundamental form. So you have a null second fundamental form in E4 direction and a null second fundamental form in E3 direction, right? So these are ka kappa and kappa bar, which you see there. You have kappa, and uh, I didn't write kappa bar, but uh, that's by symmetry. And then you have many others. So for example, uh, I, I wrote there, say, xi. This xi is g of d e4, e4 of e a. So this is a one vector. So yeah, by the way, I should, I should say here, which is very important, so you see this a and b uh, can you, you can have the indices 1 1 1 2 2 1 and 2 2 now in the particular case when e4 is uh, uh, when the distribution is integrable in other words when these two things are integrable here then actually this second fundamental form like any last second fundamental like like any sac like sorry like any fundamental forms uh, like any second fundamental form, I should say, they have to be symmetric. It's easy to see that the symmetry comes because of the fact that this is integral. In general, it's not true. So in, in most cases, uh, these components will be equal by symmetry, but not necessarily the other one. And not necessarily always, because uh, as we'll see examples in a second, in interesting situations, you may not have integrability. Okay, in any case, that's a situation. This is, a, this is now a vector on the two sphere. Or, or on the horizontal structure if you don't have integrability. And the same thing for xi bar, where you put here e3, e3, d3, e3. So for example, if e4 is geodesic, if d4, e4 is geodesic equal to zero, then this coefficients will be automatically zero, which is again some, something that you can choose to do in, in various situations, you can do, uh, you can make them to be zero or not. All right, so as you see, uh, you can do many other combinations and you get all the other uh, connection coefficients. We call it connection coefficients or Ricci coefficients, gamma. Okay, now what about the curvature? So, the so these are Christopher. You said Ricci. Sorry? Ricci. No, Christopher or Ricci. Yeah, but R Ricci is usually, Christopher is used for coordinates, okay. right? And Ricci is used for, it's the same thing more or less, but here it's a frame and in the other case are coordinates, right? Okay, so, uh, so next you go to curvature and the curvature has four components, I mean four tensors, it's a four tensor, right? And uh, uh, because of the fact that Ricci is equal to zero, it means if you are in one plus three dimensions, it means you, you have here exactly 10 components relative to the frame, there should be exactly 10 components. And okay. Uh, this, will, this is the val tensor, exactly, right. All right, so then uh, you write down, again, various possibilities. I can take, for example, R, E A, E4, E B, E4, right? So this is one component, which is called alpha. So again, it depends on two indices, and it's very easy to see that it's symmetric because of the Ricci uh, condition. This is symmetric, and therefore, uh, it's not only symmetric, actually, it's also traceless. So I if I look at, if I look at uh, delta AB, alpha AB, I get also zero, okay? And again, this is because of the Ricci, because of the properties of the Riemann curvature tensor in uh, Ricci flat. Similarly, I can take alpha bar AB, if I replace C4 by 3, 
And then I can also do this. I can take R, E, A, E4, E3, E4. And I take one half. And I call this beta. Right? So you see it's another. So these are two components here, two components here, two components here. Right? Because this has two components because it's symmetric and traceless in, 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 in two. So it's a matrix, a two by two matrix, which is symmetric traceless. This is a vector, so it has two components. Then I, I can do the same thing where I replace E3, E4, E3. So by symmetry, actually this has a minus, but, but this doesn't matter. Minus beta bar A, right? So I put a, an underline here to, to illustrate the symmetry. And then I have to have two more components, which are R, E3, E4, E3, E4, right? So that's uh, what I call rho, actually four rho. So this is one over four rho. And then finally, there is another one where I do exactly the same thing with a Hodge dual, right? So I take the Hodge dual and I do the same thing and I call this rho star, okay? So these are the, the 10 components. As, uh, as it should be. <coughs> and these decompositions are crucial because the, every component behaves differently. Right. Okay. And uh, so it's extremely important to get familiar with uh, this kind of decompositions. All right. So, uh, so then you can write down main equations, right? So I have curvature, I have connection coefficients. Main equation, well, the equation I'm going, just going to write symbolically, maybe I'll say more later. But normally, uh, you are going to have some, uh, the, the, the typical equations look like this, d gamma plus gamma times gamma is equal to curvature. And then you have Bianchi. So dr is equal to 0. These are the Bianchi identities. So in, in fact, actually, I should be careful. I, I should write it like this. If I look at components, and I take d delta, and I take uh, <coughs> cyclic permutations of this synthesis, I get zero, right? This is the um, identity. So this is what I write here. Not the contracted one. Not the contracted one. These are the, the full ones. And, uh, and this one, of course, is uh, the usual relation, the Cartan, say, relation between gamma, Ricci coefficients, and the curvature. Okay? So again, in, in because we, we are decomposing these components, I have to be careful to also decompose this relative to components, and I'll, I'll get a, a lot of equations this way, okay? And uh, uh, to work in this business, you really have to understand very well these kind, of, uh, these kind of equations. All right, now I think I can turn off the light. Is this here? This one, or? It's fine? Okay. All right, so now I go to uh, the Kerr family again, just to remind you. But uh, the new thing here that I want you uh, to remember, somewhat at least, is that in this coordinate, so this is explicit formulation of, uh, of the Kerr metric, you find out these vectors E3 and D4 which are null, so it's easy to check that they are null. Uh, and they are called principal null directions for the reason that you, you'll see in a second. Okay? So, so these are the kind of E3, E4 that I want to pick. Okay? So in care, this is a pair that I'm interested in. Right? Now, observe that if I were in Minkowski space, if I were exactly in Minkowski space, uh, in other words, a and, and, and m will be 0, then E3 will be precisely dt minus dr, and E4 will be dt plus dr. Right? So these are very simple null directions uh, that obviously are important to understand the radiations of, of say, linear equations in Minkowski space. Uh, th th this, th this play a fundamental role from that point of view. Otherwise, they are much more complicated, but they're still null. Okay, so now, uh, again, I'm just repeating what I said before. I have E3 and E4. I have the span of uh, E1, E2, which are perpendicular to E3, E4. 
I define the co connection coefficients, and you see some of them. Okay, uh, so they all play an important role. And then you have a curvature components, which I, I mentioned, which are these ones. All right, now, uh, okay, so now here is an important thing, a crucial fact, is that if I look at uh, the principal null frame, in other words, the frame that I wrote down in borel linkus coordinates for the care solution, if I look at exactly in that frame, I find out that all the components of the curvature are zero, with the exception of the uh, so-called middle components, rho and i rho star, right, which can be complexified like this. So if I put them together, I get this very simple expression, minus 2m divided by r plus i a cosine theta to the power 3. So see that there is some miraculous thing happening if you complexify. And then, uh, and then this other component, psi, psi bar, chi hat, and chi bar hat are zero. So these are, uh, these are Ricci coefficients. I didn't tell you what chi hat is. Maybe I should say it now. So chi hat AB is a chi where I subtract the trace. So chi AB and I subtract one, one delta AB times a trace. So the, the trace of chi is uh, delta AB chi AB, right? Okay, and this, this play also a very important role. Okay, so, uh, so if I am exactly in care, then you, you get a lot of cancellations. And uh, it's because of this that the principal null frame is so important. These are the components of what, of the curvature? Or? So these are components of the curvature, right? So these are all the curvature components that we discussed. These are the ones that we discussed here. And in care, they are exactly all zero with the exception of the, the, the rho and rho star, which are these two here. And uh, in addition, you get a lot of Ricci coefficients to be zero. Now, it's interesting, however, and this is important to point out, that in care, uh, E3, E4, the perpendicular to it, in other words, the, this distribution perpendicular, is not integrable. It's not an integrable distribution. Right? So in other words, you, go, you don't get two surfaces. No, E1, right? E2. No, E1, E2 are not. Right, so th th this is, the perpendicular is exactly the E1, E2. So they are not integrable. Right. So, which is quite a remarkable fact about the care solution. And that, again, another reason why it's so complicated. So th this is not integrable. So it doesn't fit into sort of normal geometric patterns somehow, right? Clearly, the principal direction are extremely important, and yet they are not integrable, so, uh, which is kind of uh, bad. So in particular, this chi uh, 1, 2 and chi 2, 1 are different. Okay? So they are not the same. Right? So you don't have the symmetry that you usually get into uh, for null, form, for, null uh, second for second fundamental form, I should say. So second fundamental form, I remember, for any, for any surface, if you have any surface, not necessarily a two-surface, any surface maybe three-dimensional and so on, you can define the normal, you take the normal and you take the second fundamental, the induced second fundamental form. The second fundamental form is always symmetric if this is a, a true hypersurface. If it's not, if it's just a distribution, it's not going to be symmetric. All right, so that's, uh, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, in, actually, I should say it's fortunate because it makes us uh, do interesting things. Uh, so in Schwarzschild, we have in addition, so if I am in Schwarzschild now and I look at the same null pair, but in Schwarzschild, so I take A to be zero in other words, you get that actually this is integrable. So in that case, it's in, you, you get integrability. So, so you get spheres, yes, right. Uh, in addition, you get the draw star is equal to zero. In other words, this last component that comes from the Hodge dual, this is actually zero. And you also get additional components. In addition to this, you also get these other components, which are zero. And in fact, the only non-vanishing components of the of gammas are trace chi, trace chi bar, omega, and omega bar. Right? So trace chi is what I just defined. Trace chi bar, omega, and omega bar. So these are the only things that, uh, that uh, I, I should say omega is defined like this. is d4, e4, e3, with so I think one quarter. Right? So that's, uh, an omega bar is defined by symmetry. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's what it is. Now, if you are in, in Minkowski, 
in addition to all that, so in addition to Schwarzschild, you also have that omega, omega bar, and rho are zero. So all curvature components are zero. So in, obviously in Minkowski space, the curvature is zero, right? It's a flat space. And, uh, and you also have these components omega, omega bar equal to zero. So th therefore, the only thing which is not zero are this, and this of course a very simple geometric meaning, these two expansions. They are called expansions. So these are called expansions, actually. And they played a role in, in, uh, in what I talked about last time, I mean, uh, on, what was it, on Friday? Uh, because they were connected with, uh, uh, with a definition of a trap surface. A trap surface was defined if in terms of these two quantities, which are called expansions. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay, now, you want to talk about perturbations. So, uh, I want to take a Kerr solution and perturb it a little bit. And the expectation is that that somehow you are going to get something which at least, in the least, will stay close to the original K solution you started with, right? So for that point of view, uh, it makes sense to start talking at the, the simplest level, to talk about O of epsilon perturbations of care. So what is O of epsilon perturbation of care? Well, uh, everything that vanished in care I now assume that is all of epsilon. In other words, I assume that there exists a frame, E3, E4, E1, E2, right? Which is close to the frame of care in some way, right? And uh, I assume that relative to this frame, all components which were zero in care, exactly zero, are now all of epsilon, right? It's reasonable, right? You, you expect that things are not going to uh, deviate too much. And epsilon is a parameter which I, 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 I control. Okay. Now, what is the problem with this definition? The problem is that there are lots of frames which achieve this. Right? So if I have a frame for which I have this, in other words, if I have a frame of that type in which these components are all of epsilon, but then I have a lot of others which are also all of epsilon because I can take any frame transformation uh, which takes a null frame into another null frame. So I start from E3, E4, E1, E2, and I get to E1, E2, E3, the, the primes, E3 prime, E4 primes. So, uh, and I, I can write down all the possible frame transformations. I, I write here all of epsilon squared terms because actually the, the formulas are more complicated. There are many other terms. But in any case, I just want to concentrate on the uh, O of epsilon terms. So in other words, if f, f bar, and log lambda are O of epsilon, then if I transform the original frame into this new frame, then these conditions will be preserved, right? So it means I have infinitely many such spaces which are O of epsilon. So which what frame do I choose? And this is of fundamental importance because of what I said. The frame is going to be to play a fundamental role. Otherwise, if I don't understand what is the correct frame in which I, I do my calculations and I prove my stability result, I'm not going to be able to do anything. So this is the first important uh, uh, fact that, that uh, there are lots of frame transformations uh, which preserve these conditions. And lambda f and lambda f are scalar. Uh, well, lambda is a scalar. And f as this indices, f a, so this is a is 1 and 2, and f bar a is a equal 1 and 2. So there are five parameters in some sense. All right, so uh, now the one thing which is important to remark, this is a, the first important remark in connection with this stuff, which is quite remarkable actually, is that the curvature components alpha, alpha bar, so these are the components which I defined here, if you remember. Right? So these components, so they are components which are obtained by taking two E4s. Uh, these components are all of epsilon square invariant. This is a, a huge observation in some sense. I mean, it's trivial to prove, but it's huge because it tells you that, that at least some of the components of this, uh, of the curvature, uh, are actually invariant up to all of epsilon squared. So they are not just all of epsilon, but all of epsilon squared. So if I make, if, if I take any frame and I take a transformation like this, the, the difference between alpha and alpha prime 
is going to be all of, all of epsilon squared, and the same thing with alpha bar. So that's a huge fact because uh, it tells you that at least I can put my hands on some facts which are almost invariant. Being all of epsilon squared invariant, it means that at least at least at, at linear level they are totally invariant, right? I mean, the, in other words, the choice that I make on my frame does not going to affect alpha and alpha bar yeah? at a linear level. So this is clearly a, a, a huge observation, even though it's trivial. I mean, you can really write down. I mean, it's not it's not a big deal. It's just a simple calculation to show that, but it's clearly very important. Okay, so so this is what it is. Now, oh, sorry, uh, there was another observation here. Uh, another observation is that uh, if, in addition, I, I'm dealing with perturbation of Minkowski space, right? So I'm not, not just, uh, so this is a general perturbation of care. If I look at perturbation of, of uh, Minkowski space, then in fact all curvature components, so everything here, including rho and rho star, rho star they are all invariant quantities in that case. So clearly the stability of Minkowski space is simpler because of this, because the, the decomposition of curvature, you, you can think of the decomposition of curvature into components, does not depend in up to terms quadratic in epsilon. They do not depend on the particular choice of frames I make. Right? So these are invariants. From the point of view of nonlinear theory, I can, I can view them as invariants. So these are invariant components. So in other words, the full curvature tensor is invariant in if I do perturbation of Minkowski space. If I am perturbation of care, I only have alpha alpha bar to be invariant. By the way, so this is true about the curvature. If I look at the other components, like uh, these ones, they of course they are totally non-invariant. I mean, they are far from being invariant. So all these other, the, the, the connection coefficients are far from being invariant. They definitely change in a major way whenever I make a, a, a transformation. And it's because, and this will play an important role when I make my final choices of uh, of uh, gauges. To first order in epsilon, it's invariant up to first order terms in epsilon. Uh, uh, second order, epsilon squared, second, S right? Up to up to these no, terms. No, 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 but the other ones. I mean. Oh, these ones, yeah. So they they are, no, yeah. So in other words, they are not invariant because they they, are, they change even at a linear level. All right, so. So now, uh, what I want to do now uh, is, is to actually spend a little bit more time about stability of Minkowski space, and then I'll come back and, and talk about, uh, about the care solution. Okay, so what time is it? All right, so stability of Minkowski space. All right, so for this, I have to, in order to uh, discuss it, I want to start with very simple things. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start with uh, sort of a very simple discussion. So first of all, uh, if you remember when I, we talk about the Einstein equations for each of g equal to zero, remember that I said at some point that I if you pick up coordinates which verify the wave equation equal to zero, the wave equation relative to g, in other words, if you look at, so, coordinates. For coordinates. so these are harmonic coordinates or wave coordinates we call them, uh, if you if you use this kind of coordinates, then the equation take this form: alpha beta d alpha d beta of g. And here it's any component of g, and is equal to going to be uh, an f mu nu of uh, or a nonlinear term, let's say n uh, of g and first derivative of g. And uh, it's quadratic, so this is quadratic in first derivatives of g. So this is the kind of equation you get. Right? So you see, it, it's a nonlinear system of wave equations. Right? So obviously, you have to understand this uh, if you are to do anything uh, that has to do with stability. You, you have to understand the long time behavior of solutions of this equation. So let me simplify a little bit uh, and look at somewhat something simpler, but which symbolically is very similar. 
So suppose I, I look at uh, Lorentzian metric G alpha beta of phi, d alpha d beta of phi. And here I write uh, just a function of phi and first derivative of phi. Right? So you see, I, I replace this g, I replace it by a phi so that I get a scalar equation, just, just to simplify things a little bit. Right? So, so this is the kind of equation I get. I can simplify it even further. Right? So this is, let's say, this is type 1, this is type 2, this is type 3. I can assume that actually this is just a Minkowski space, Minkowski metric, so in which case I'm getting uh, the Minkowski metric, so d'Alembertian of phi in Minkowski space uh, is equal to n of phi and first derivative of phi, right? So that's a reasonable, a reasonable model problem. If I want to understand, if I want to understand this, I first want to understand this. To understand this, I have to understand this. To understand this, I first have to understand this because it, it's much simpler. So this is a kind of equation that you should be able to control if you are to uh, prove stability. So for example, if, I, if I'm to prove the stability of Minkowski space, then I have to start with the initial data which are close to the Minkowski metric. M mu nu is a Minkowski metric, right? So uh, in particular, in relative to this model problem, I'm interested then in discussing the initial value problem, say the simplest initial value problem, which is uh, when phi is equal, exactly equal to zero. So phi equal to zero is of course a solution of this. This is quadratic here, quadratic in d phi. So this is uh, clearly a solution. Phi equal to zero is a solution. So this solution corresponds in some sense to the Minkowski metric in, in, in terms of uh, this al analogy with the equation here. Right? So here I want to perturb the Minkowski metric which, where all the components are, uh, so these are minus one, 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 and zero everywhere else. And here I want to go, I, I want to perturb phi equal to zero, right? So it's a, it's a very reasonable approximation, very reasonable model problem. So I want to prescribe now at t equals zero, I want to prescribe uh, phi to be, say, epsilon, some small parameter, f of x, and dt of phi, I want to be epsilon times g of x. Well, let's say f and g are some smooth functions with compact support for simplicity. So anything, very reasonable functions, test functions. All right, and I want to show that if epsilon is sufficiently small, I would be interested to prove stability. I would, I would like to show that if epsilon is sufficiently small, in other words, if I perturb around the solution phi is equal to zero, let's call it phi zero, if I perturb around this, I, I want to get a global solution uh, which converges back to this one, for example, right? Okay, so this is, uh, this is a kind of question that you want to ask. Is it true that this, uh, this problem is stable under small perturbation, in other words, for small epsilon? All right, so, uh, so this is the kind of thing that uh, I want to talk about it. All right, so, uh, okay, so how do you deal with this, this kind of issue? So let me actually simplify even more and look at the version of phi. It's just dt of phi squared, right? So this is simplification number four, which is the one I have it there. And uh, again, you, you start with initial conditions, which are this one, small, so for small epsilon, I want to know, I want to understand what happens. So how do you deal with this problem? Well, uh, you see, if I didn't have this term here, then th the only thing that allows me to understand the solutions of the wave equation uh, are energy norms, energy, right? So the, the, the simplest kind of energy identity is that if I take E zero of phi to be one half integral of dt phi squared plus d one phi squared plus dn of phi squared. I assume that I'm in, in Minkowski space of uh, n plus one dimensions. So if I take E0 of phi, evaluate at time t, so I'm integrated on, on t equal constant, right? So I'll call it sigma t. Sigma t mean e t equal constant. So I'm integrated with respect to dx. Dx. Sorry? N coordinates. 
there are n coordinates, so it's dx1, dxn, right? dxn, right? So I'm integrating with no time coordinates. So the, the time is fixed, right? So I'm integrating, in other words, the picture is that uh, this is t equals 0. This is uh, t equal, say, uh, t0. And uh, this is the t axis, and this is the uh, rn axis, right? Okay, so I'm integrating at fixed t. And uh, the, the conservation law tells you that E0 phi uh, time t is the same as E0 phi uh, time 0. Right? So this is just conservation of energy, which is something very easy to deduce. OK, but of course, my problem is that I have something on the right-hand side. Right? So ju just this conservation law by itself is not enough. Uh, and in fact, what one does is you look at higher derivatives. You, you commute these equations with derivatives, right? So you get, uh, since this is a flat wave operator, I can commute here. I commute here, right? And then I apply the energy estimate for the new field here, and is what I call ES of i, right? So this is the energy for S derivatives, uh, right? Which is the same thing. It's uh, E0 of phi of, uh, let's say, d, d alpha of uh, phi. So it's a sum for absolute value of alpha less or equal to s. In other words, I take all derivative up to order s. And this is my a new norm, which is a generalized energy norm, which I call ES of phi. So ES of phi, again, if I were exactly in Minkowski space, this would be true, ES of phi times 0, right? So this will also be conserved. So in other words, I have a lot of conserved quantities if I am exactly in flat space. But if I am not in flat space, I have to do something about this term, right? So uh, you have to do, it's not a big deal. One can prove the statement that one can prove. Maybe I'll so I can prove the statement that the energy, the full energy for the entire system, the nonlinear system, remains bounded by the, the same energy at time zero, provided that I have a certain condition satisfied, which is very easy to see. Uh, when you do these energy estimates now with the right-hand side, it's easy to see that you can control all the energy if you can, col can control this quantity. In other words, you if you can control that the integral from zero to t of dt phi in L infinity is bounded by, say, one. Okay. So as long as you control that, you are fine. OK, but you see, this is uh, highly non-trivial, because you need, you need, in particular, that the L infinity norm decays. right? So in order for this to be integrable, it has to decay at least like t to the minus 1 minus something. right? So the L infinity norm has to decay. So is it true that, the L infinity norm, you, that you can show that the L infinity norm is decay? And here, it's the main the major uh, technical complication in all this business, even when you do perturbation expansions a la the Thibault, I was hoping that Thibault is here, but he's not. Even if you do, if you do those uh, perturbation designs, you have the same kind of difficulties, right? So in order to prove anything, it's not enough to control the energy. You also have to control this quantity. All right, so the, how do you control that quantity? Well, uh, traditionally, and this, I'm sure, is done by Thibault. So when, when he does his calculation, traditionally, this is done by looking, again, at the original linear equation and writing down the fundamental solution. So using the fundamental solution, combining the fundamental solution with a nonlinear part, it's a mess. It's very complicated. In any case, in, in linear, if you have just this equation, it's actually not too difficult to see from the fundamental solution. If you write down the fundamental solution, it's not so difficult to see that, uh, that uh, the solutions will decay like t to the minus n minus 1 over 2. Right? Independent of the parity of n? Uh, for every, in every dimension, you get exactly t to the minus n minus 1 over 2. I mean, the, that's your, the optimal thing, opt optimal decay. Of course, there are superposition of waves. Some waves behave fast, decay faster. But, but you'll always get uh, waves which decay only like this, minus n minus 1 over 2, and uh, nothing better. Right? And then, of course, this is a problem. Uh, uh, and uh, in particular, it's a problem because you see that if n is equal to 3 here, 
right? Which is an interesting dimension. This will be divergent. That integral will be divergent, so we will not be able to do anything. But even more complicated is how do you ensure that this cell infinity norm decay at all? Because uh, it's extremely complicated now. You, if you use a fundamental solution, it will be a huge mess. It can be done, and people do it in asymptotic expansion. But there is another way of doing it, right? Uh, which is, uh, I think, much better. And uh, so that's the one that I want to describe very fast. This has to do with what's called the, the vector field method. So the vector field method is based on the idea that somehow you should not commute only with normal derivative. You have in Minkowski space, you have in addition, you have in addition to, yeah, maybe I should keep this here and do. So you have in addition to the, the usual derivatives which commute. Right, so we have that uh, dt, d, d1, dx1, so dxn, I'm going to call it d1, dn. Uh, they all commute uh, with a wave equation, right? So you have the uh, d alpha uh, version is zero, and that's why you could, you could uh, form these higher de energy estimates. But there are other vector fields which commute. So th there are, in fact, a lot of vector fields. For example, there is uh, the vector field so xi dj minus xj di, or xi dt plus t di, uh, and there is also t dt plus uh, xi di. See here, I'm summing over, I'm summing over i, right? So i is from one to n. Okay, so this this vector field I'm going to call s. This is actually a, a Lorentz boost, right? So this is what we could call Li is a, from Lorentz, and this is an angular, uh, right? So th th these are generated by rotations, these are generated by boosts, and these are, gener th these are generated by scale transformations. It's very easy to see that they, all these vector fields commute. So any of these vector fields, let's call it x, commutes with the Dalambertian. Either it's zero, or actually, in the case of this one, you get minus two down version, right? So in particular, it takes solutions to solutions, okay? So because of the- Symmetries of the down version operators. Sorry? These are symmetries of the down version operators. Yeah, but they are in fact symmetries, of course, of the, of the space time metric, of the Minkowski space. They are killing, so all these vector fields are actually killing, or so these are all killing in Minkowski space, and these are conformal killing. Right? So they, they are all very useful. Right? So they are useful because they commute, and therefore I can put uh, these vector fields here. And instead of looking at generalized energy norms of this type, I can take any vector field here, any number of, with any number of vector fields. Right? So this allows me to define uh, a, a, some kind of Sobolev space. Right? This will be some, some kind of Sobolev space which is a generalization of the usual solar space because it contains, I, I, I'm willing to contain uh, kind of uh, all sorts of vector fields. Okay, so the consequence of all this is that this generalized energy norm which I have there, this generalized energy norm which I have here is actually conserved for the wave equation. For just the wave equation, it's conserved. So if I take solution of the wave equation, then this ES of i is also conserved. So it's another conserved quantity. And uh, the remarkable thing about this quantity is that it allows you to show that uh, the solution decays, in fact. So if you remember, I said that the solution should decay like t to the minus n minus one over two, but you see that here you get even more. By using this method, uh, since ES of i is conserved, it means that uh, it, if it starts by being bounded at time t equals zero, it's going to be bounded at all later times, and therefore I can assume that ES of i is bounded. I'm using s larger than n over two, the, the s test for the number of, of vector fields I take here. So I take s derivatives, integer, larger than n over two. It's exactly the n over two that comes in the Sobolev inequality. And uh, I'm able to control the L infinity norm in terms of the Sobolev norm, which is larger than n over two. But instead of having just boundedness, I also get decay now, and the decay comes from the, these vector fields. So anyway, so this is a, th th this is the whole point, because it allows you to reduce decay to energy. So instead of doing 
decay using the fundamental solution, which is extremely complicated and almost never works, I can do the I can do the decay using, I can incorporate uh, information about decay in my basic energy norms. And of course, energy is much more robust. Energy estimates are much more robust. We use it all the time in PD. So anyway, so this is, uh, this is what happens. Uh, and uh, uh, the conclusion is that now you get this kind of decay rate. You see when, you see that in this picture, when T is exactly absolute value of X, right? So I if I look in Minkowski space, so I might have t equal 0 here. And this is t equal r, t equal absolute value of x, right? Absolute value of x equal to r. So, uh, so if I am, if I'm looking at solution of the wave equation along null direction, right? So if I look at the behavior along null directions, I see that the best behavior is exactly the one given by by, uh, so thi this will not be useful because t is like absolute value of x, so this is b of 4 the 1, and I'm getting just t like minus n minus 1 over 2. So I get exactly the decay which I have here. But this uh, gives me additional information because it tells me that if I'm inside the light cone, so in particular if this is, uh, if absolute value of x is much less than t, then I get another t to the minus a half from here, so you get the decay even better, you get t to the minus n over 2, right? So as a consequence, this is a, a, a much better way of understanding decay if I'm to deal with nonlinear problems. Uh, and uh, once I use this type of estimate, yeah, by the way, there is even more, which is extremely important in what I'm going to say. If I see phi decays only like t to the minus n minus 1 over 2, but if I take the frame, so remember that I have this frame, which is uh, E3 is L bar, which is dt minus dr and E4, which is L, which is dt plus dr. So if I take, if I take uh, E4 of phi, or if I take the other elements of, my, of the frame, E4 or Ea, right? So uh, I, I have the other E1, E2 here, right, the, for the null frame. Which are, so these are, are orthogonal to these two. If I take uh, the derivative in this direction, in fact, I get t to the minus n minus 1 over 2 minus 1. So I gain a, an order of decay for both of them. And the only one which does not, the only one which does not improve is E3 or 4. So E3 or 4 is t, t to the minus n minus 1 over 2. So uh, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, even a E3 derivative improves but in proofs in this component, so in, instead of being 1 plus t minus x minus 1 over 2, it would be minus 3 over 2. But it means that near the light cone, it still does not improve, right? Okay, so that's, uh, uh, so that's a remarkable amount of information that you can get from these very simple uh, function analytic methods, which are based on symmetries. Once you, you have that, now you can go back and analyze this, uh, this type of equations that we discussed. The ambition of phi is f of phi, derivative of phi, and second derivative of phi. So I, I look at, in other words, I look at very general perturbations of just the wave equation, the ambition of phi equal to zero. And I'm looking at uh, the vacuum state phi equal to zero. I'm looking at the stability of the vacuum state, phi equal to zero, right? And uh, uh, it turns out that phi equal to zero. So again, if you remember my discussion with Slava last time, that he, he didn't, he couldn't believe that uh, exponentially growing mods is not good in, uh, the fact that you don't have exponentially growing mods is not good for, sta for stability. Uh, so here, you see, if you look at the dimension of phi equal to zero, in other words, if you look at linearization around zero, this is the equation you get, which is of course stable. It doesn't have any exponentially growing mods. Not only that, but it also decays. If I am in dimension three, it, dec it decays like t to the minus one. If in, I'm in dimension one, it decays like t to the power zero, right? So it's bounded in any case. But uh, if I perturb it, if I look at the nonlinear problem and I look at general perturbations, in fact, uh, it, these are unstable. So uh, for example, uh, if I look at these equations, dt phi squared, this will blow up in finite time. So, and it forms, in fact, shock waves. So, the, so shock waves, uh, can be the result of a very 
of a perturbation of a very s simple state, like phi equal to zero. Right? And of course, uh, I mentioned also uh, turbulence. In the, case of the, in the case of the Euler equations, again, you start with u equal to zero, and you can end up in finite time. In a very short time, you can end up with, with uh, solutions which, have no pro which you have absolutely no control, uh, which are extremely unstable. Nevertheless, <laughs> the state u equal to zero is a bound, the linearization around it gives you bounded solution. So there is no, there is no issue of exponential growing modes or anything like that. It's much less, and you still get the. Uh, all right. OK, so anyway, uh, in dimension n equals to 3, typically most equations are unstable, and that's the case exactly of this equation. In dimension uh, less than 2, it's even worse, right? Dimension 1 is terrible. Uh, if you are in dimension four, it gets better. You, you can actually prove something. The dimension is critical. But of course, since we are interested in dimension three, dimension three, <laughs> most equations are bad. The, you need equations which verify uh, structural conditions on the nonlinearity. So in order, in order to have existence, to have stability of this vacuum state, I need some kind of condition on this, a structural condition on this. This is called the null condition. So the, if the null condition is satisfied, which I call here, if the null if f verifies the null condition, then phi is structurally stable. Uh, so what is the null condition? So I, I'm not going to go into a formal definition. I'll just say something uh, very simple, which I mentioned here. You see, relative to a null frame, if you look at the composition with respect to null frames, you see that derivatives in these directions improve, and it's only this direction is very bad. And therefore, you expect a nonlinearity of this type to be bad, right? But any nonlinearity where you have, say, E3 multiplied by E4 or Ea, this will be, uh, this will be OK. So the null condition is just a way of saying that the worst possible directions are not present when you do a decomposition of the nonlinearity relative to the null frame. Right? So you take so it's a very simple procedure. You take the null you, you take the nonlinear equation, you look at the nonlinear terms, you do an expansion in terms of the null frame, and if you see the presence of these bad states, you are done. I mean, it means the null condition is not verified, uh, and uh, if you don't see it, then you say the null condition is verified. Now, of course, things are more complicated, but that's roughly uh, the simplest way to to say that. Now, uh, let me, actually this goes, ah, this, I'm sorry, I should have realized that I can do it this way. Okay, so, uh, so dimension n is equal to critical. So now condition, so now condition is something extremely important, which will play a role in, in what I'm going to say. Uh, and I'll finish the first hour, so what time is it? Ten. Ten past three. Ten past three, so it's a good, it's a good time to take a break. So I'll, I'll finish with this fact. Geometric nonlinear wave equations verify some gauge dependent version of the null condition. So, this is a remarkable fact. Many equations of interest in mathematical physics that are derived from a geometric Lagrangian do verify the null condition. So, for example, the Einstein equations verify the null condition. But, uh, and there is an important but, the null condition, you see, it's a condition on the nonlinearity. It's, it, it's not about the linear equation, it's about the nonlinear. It's a structural condition on the nonlinear equation. And uh, uh, it, the complicated equations like the Einstein equations do verify the null condition, but only if you take into a, a account the gauge condition. So the gauge condition is essential. So only if I, if I mod out I, I the equations by by the diffeomorphic group, and I, I look at, the, in other words, I look at a correct framework, a correct gauge dependent framework, I will see the null condition. So for example, in what I mentioned earlier here, <laughs> if I look at uh, the Einstein equations in this kind of uh, harmonic ordinates, they don't satisfy the null condition. So the null condition is, is, is just simply not true. There is something else which is called the weak null condition, which is still verified in this, co in this context, but the, the null condition is not verified. And uh, nevertheless, the Einstein equation is definitely verified the null condition, and that's the reason why, why uh, the Minkowski space will be possible. All right, let me finish with this uh, vector field method before taking the break. 
So the, the, the vector field method is now a general method of studying nonlinear equations, which to, to some extent you could say is, uh, it's certainly not dependent on perturbations, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a robust method of uh, deriving uh, estimates, decay estimates, by using, uh, reducing it to, uh, to energy type estimates, so uh, in other words, integral estimates, which is based on symmetries or approximate symmetry or other geometric features to derive generalized energy bounds. In other words, uh, generalized energy bounds, I mean this kind of norms which have those vector fields, but it, it, it could be even more complicated than that. Uh, when, uh, to derive uh, energy bounds and robust L infinity quantitative decay, because as we saw, if you have bounds on the energies, you are also going to have uh, L infinity quantitative decay. And it applies, so this method applies not just to the wave equation, as I showed here, but it applies to tensor field equations like the Maxwell and uh, Bianchi type equations in Minkowski space. So, for example, the Maxwell equations. Uh, are uh, such an example where you can still use exactly the same techniques in order to get decay. So in other words, you, you, commute, you commute this equation by taking lead derivative relative to the same vector fields. You can commute and you get the same equations verified by the lead derivatives, and then you create norms based on these lead derivatives, and from it you read the decay. Okay? Right? And then you can treat nonlinear problems as a consequence. All right, so I'll stop here. Okay, so uh, right, so the vector field method. So again, the vector field method, uh, you could think of it as a non-perturbative tool uh, to study classical field equations, right? Uh, something that does not require any more to talk about expansions and, and fundamental solution. Uh, it's it's non-perturbative, uh, and uh, it's very general. It can be applied in many situations. Uh, and uh, in particular, it applies to Maxwell equations, as I said, but it also applies to the Einstein equations in the following sense. So if you, if you, uh, if you look at a solution of the Einstein equation, so reach, reach of g is equal to zero, uh, then uh, if you look at uh, the Bianchi identities, so you take cyclic permutation equal to zero, Right, uh, it's uh, it's very easy to see from here if you take the divergence. It, it, it's easy to see. Sorry, it, it's easy to see that that this also implies that uh, the divergence. Uh, so there is a derivative with respect to alpha equal to zero. So I, which I can write as delta of r is equal to zero. But at the same time. It's not so hard to see that something similar happens with R star, and I can derive also, so if, in other words, if I take the Hodge dual, and I remember the Hodge dual is defined uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta is epsilon, where epsilon is a volume form, epsilon, alpha, beta, mu, nu, and uh, R mu, nu, gamma, delta, with a one half here, right? So you, so. There is a very simple way of defining the dual, the Hodge dual. So the Hodge dual verifies the same thing. Delta of R star is equal to zero. Only with respect to one pair of indices, not the indices. Yeah, only with respect to one pair, <coughs> exactly. So you see that, uh, that formally you can write down the Einstein, the Bianchi identities, you can write it like this, dr equal to zero. This corresponds to this, right? But then you have also this other one, delta R is equal to zero. And this is very similar to what you had in the Maxwell theory, right? Okay, so uh, uh, and now if you, you, you can start doing the same thing that we did uh, for Maxwell equations, you can start doing the same thing by taking the lead derivative with respect to vector, by commuting with various vector fields, right? So I take x1, xn, and I hope that, that this goes inside, and therefore after that, I'm going to treat these equations very much like the Maxwell equations. So the Maxwell equation in Minkowski space, of course. Now, of course, there is a problem because 
I need it in order to do this in Minkowski space. I need the symmetries of Minkowski space, right? So I need killing. I need the uh, axis to be killing or conform a killing vector field. Uh, and of course, if I take a general solution of the Einstein equation, there is no way I'm going to have killing or conform a killing vector field, right? So the only thing I can hope, and this is uh, what I'm going to talk about in a second, is that that this x1, xn are approximate killing vector fields. So, I, so you, you have to, so in Nikovsky space, you have the killing plus conformal killing. So in uh, perturbations of Minkowski space, I have to take uh, uh, approximate killing plus conformal killing. So what does that mean? Well, it's very simple to define in a way, because in Minkowski space, uh, uh, so in general, a uh, killing vector field means that the D derivative with respect to the vector field of the metric is equal to zero, right? Okay, so this, in general, I'm going to define it as deformation tensor pi of pi, so the deformation tensor of x. So pi x alpha beta is in fact d alpha x beta plus d beta x alpha. So this is from the killing equation, right? So this is equal to zero implies that x is killing. But of course, I cannot expect to have killing vector fields if I do a general perturbation of, uh, of Minkowski space. I won't have them, but I might hope to have this sufficiently small. So of course, now if I take, uh, say, d of uh, li x of r, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be here some complicated expression involving r and pi, something uh, involving a product between curvature and the pi, the deformation tensor, right? So let's call it pi x, the deformation tensor of uh, this vector field. And this now is of the same order of complication that what I had here when we treated the ambition of i is derivative of i squared, right? Because now, now this is a complicated term that I have to control. And in order to control it, I need decay now. So I cannot, there is no way I can prove anything, any stability result, if I don't know how to control this one. But to control this one, I need to control the decay, at least of one of the factors. In fact, I need to control both factors. I need to control the decay of both factors, both the curvature and the pi's. That's the only way I would be able to actually control the, the, uh, the curvature. So the, the crucial thing when you do stability of Minkowski space is to control the curvature. You have to control the curvature without which you don't control anything, right? So let me now go through a discussion of that. <laughs> All right, so, uh, okay. So let's talk about stability of Minkowski space. So. Uh, I'm trying to solve the Ricci flat. I start with the initial data set, which consists, as usual, between uh, a three manifold, a metric, which is uh, now it's a, it's a Riemannian metric, right? And, and a second fundamental form. And they, they verify the constraint equation, which I'm not going to write because it's not relevant, okay? But the, the constraint equations, of course, are by, its, by themselves very interesting. Okay, so now uh, I can also impose a gauge condition, at least initially, which is, uh, well, sorry, not, in, not only initially, actually, I, I impose a, a gate condition, which is uh, uh, trace k, k equal to zero. So you see, I can impose four coordinate conditions. You have to think about when I do wave coordinates, I had four coordinates here, right? Because alpha can be one, zero, one, two, three. So there are four possible coordinates. So this, this here I'm using the full coordinate I prescribe all the coordinates. Here I only prescribe one coordinate, which is, in fact, t. It, it's, it's a time coordinate. So in other words, I, I'm trying to uh, construct, I'm starting with sigma 0, and I'm constructing a foliation by sigma t, which is a time function. So by time function, I mean a function defined on the manifold such that the, the level surfaces are, uh, so first of all, this is the different to zero and the level surfaces are space-like, exactly. So, uh, but I, uh, the, the, I can think of this, a T as being, uh, as being uh, 
one coordinate condition. I have four conditions to make, and I can make one, and I assume that this is maximal. So assuming that it's maximal, it means that if I look at the second fundamental form, trace of the second fundamental form relative to the induced metric here should be zero. Okay? So that's the maximality condition. <laughs> So this, was, this is what is done in, in stability of Minkowski space. It turns out that it's not so important, but, uh, but at the time we saw that such a time function is fundamental. OK, so then uh, you have the constraint equations plus trace k equal to 0. right? And now you look at uh, the initial data set for Minkowski, which is exactly R3. This is the Euclidean metric, E, and 0, second fundamental form. So that's how, how you start. And uh, you assume asymptotic flatness. You assume asymptotic flatness. So in the definition of asymptotic flatness, now you have to be careful. So if, in other words, asymptotic flatness is always taken relative to a system of coordinates uh, outside a large compact set. So I'm at sigma 0, let's say. I take a sufficiently large compact set, and I look outside, and I look at the system of coordinates on the initial data. All right? Uh, and uh, I look at the components of the metric relative to that initial data, which are this gij. And that's where you see the mass, uh, 1 plus 2m over r delta ij. So gij minus, minus delta ij. But you have to subtract also a term which is like r to the minus 1. So this is long range for those people who know the Coulomb, uh, the Coulomb potential. That's exactly this r to the minus 1 component, which is uh, sort of a very slow decaying component. And in front of it, there is mass. And the positive mass theorem tells you that for general initial data, this m is positive. Right? This is a famous theorem of uh, Sean and Yao. It, it, so this, this positive mass theorem is only tied to the constraint equation. Only, uh, it has nothing to do with the evolution. It, it's just an issue about uh, the constraints. Okay. So, so these are the assumptions. And in addition, I want a smallness condition. I, I, in other words, I, I want to make a perturbation of the flat initial data. So I want to be initial data which are close to this one. Right? So, and you, you can make that precise. There is no point in going through this. Right? So I start up with this initial data set. So it's a small initial data set. So it's close to, to the 3D initial data set of uh, Minkowski space. And, uh, and then I look at the maximal global hyperbolic development of this, right? And I want to prove asymptotic flatness is on the initial data. Asymptotic flatness is the initial data, but it's carried by the evolution. So the evolution will carry this asymptotic flatness. So, so, the, 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 so the question is, what is the character of the maximal development? In other words, we know that there is a maximal development. In other words, uh, some local existence result that tells me that I can go up to something. But it could be that, that my spacetime terminates in finite time relative to proper, to the proper time of a, a given parameter, of a given observer. And that, of course, is unacceptable. And uh, stability should mean that, that uh, at least should mean that the spacetime reconstruct should be complete. So this is a theorem, which is a, a theorem of 1993 between Christodoulou and myself, that says that any asymptotically flat initial data set close to the flat one has a complete maximal development, which converges back to Minkowski. Right? So here, you are not converging to another parameter. You could have converged to another black hole, for example. Uh, the black hole, you can go from Minkowski to, sh to a Schwarzschild. Uh, this doesn't happen, fortunately. You mean in, 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 time in time, it could develop a black hole later on. right? So and then but it will be converging to Minkowski. The, but the converging to Minkowski. So the, the statement is that actually you stay in Minkowski space. right? And this is uh, very, very important because remember that this example, the ambition of phi is dt phi squared, right? This blows up in finite time, which means that, that there is an instability here which may lead to a black hole in the case of the Einstein equation. I mean, in this case, it's a shock wave. But in the case of the Einstein equation, it could be something that might lead you to another black hole. Or it could lead you to another singularity. Who knows, right? So anyway, so the, it was not because of this kind of examples it was not at all clear that such a statement is correct. The physicists, as always, they have their own way of simplifying the problem. And they would say, uh, that, yeah, well, of course, of course it should have been stable. But you, know, you, 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 still, you still have to give a reason for that. 
Uh, and the kind of reasons they usually gave were not, not satisfactory. So for example, one of the reasons that, that, that was, was talked about is that since the mass is positive, you cannot have, you cannot, the, the, the Mikowski space has to be stable. But in reality, you can give lots of examples where you have positive positivity of mass and it's not, you don't have stability. The simplest one is again the Berger equation. If I look at ut plus uux equal to zero, then I see that u equals zero corresponds to the energy u squared. So if I look at the energy, th this energy at uh, t equal constant is, is actually conserved, right? And you, s you start, and it's positive, right? So, so you have positivity of the energy for any initial data. And yet, of course, u equals zero is not, is not stable, right? I mean, this forms a shock wave in, in very fast, very in, in, in a very, very short time. So perturbations of order epsilon form a shock wave by the time epsilon to the minus one. So, uh, so this is very, very far from being stable. And of course, also, peace slava <laughs> is not here. <laughs> you can see that the linear case is just ut equals zero, which obviously doesn't have exponentially bond, exponentially growing modes, and nevertheless, it's unstable. Right? So u, equ u equals zero, the, the linearization is exactly ut equals zero, which of course is all solutions are bounded. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, you are very far away. So the, the fact that l you have some kind of linear stability doesn't tell you anything about the nonlinear equation. Okay, so, uh, so the Minkowski space is this one. So now, so how do you construct it? You construct it together with the gauge condition. So, okay, so let me make a, a little bit, let me come back to something I said earlier. So remember that I said that at the level of the curvature, so we have the, we have the frame, so you, you, you have the frame that is the C3, E4, and E alpha, EA, or E capital A, depending on how, you, how I write. And then we have the gammas, which are the uh, christopher Sibo or the Ricci coefficients. And then we have the curvature, right? And here we have components, right? Like chi, chi bar, and so on and so forth. And here we have components alpha, alpha bar, beta, beta bar, and rho and rho star. And, uh, and uh, we think in terms of perturbations of this, right? So these are this all of epsilon perturbations that I discussed earlier. And uh, remember that uh, we said that these are invariant. In, when I do the stability of Minkowski space, these are invariant, which is a very important fact. So because of this, the curvature itself, the components of the curvature do not depend much on how I pick up my frame. But on the other hand, the gammas are going to depend in a fundamental way. And I cannot control the curvature if I don't control the gamma because the Bianchi, in the Bianchi identities, if I write down the Bianchi identities, because the covariant derivatives depend on the gamma. So the control of the gamma is essential also in controlling the curvature. But somehow, the good thing is that I don't care too much when I treat the curvature, I don't care too much about which gauge I, I choose, right? But, okay, this is after the fact. At the time, we were not, that was not exactly the way we thought. All right, so, uh, uh, so you have to pick up a gauge Right, and the gauge consists on two things. This time function that I already mentioned, which was uh, maximal, uh, but more importantly, this optical function, which is properly initialized. So th this is m much more important, in fact, because uh, in order to <coughs> in order to understand decay, right? So you start up with initial conditions. You construct a, a time function, so a foliation by a time function. But remember that the decay properties of curvature, or of waves in general, depends on these null directions. Because in null direction, most of the energy is transmitted in null direction, and this is get, you get the worst decay. And uh, outside, you get much better decay. So it's extremely important to construct to construct some way by which you keep into account the, what are the null directions. And this is where you construct this uh, time function, th this, sorry, this optical function. You construct a, an optical function, which is uh, defined like this, 
So you construct the space time together with the foliation by uh, a second function. So you have t, and now you have a second function u, which should be viewed as like u equal constant should be like light cones in Minkowski space, right? The way to make that sure is to solve the so-called diagonal equation. So I solve uh, g. So this is a metric. d alpha of u, d beta of u is equal to zero, right? So the this, if you remember from the very beginning of my lectures, I said that's a way to see null hypersurfaces. U equal constant, if I, if I solve this equation, U equal constant is a null hypersurface. Right? So, so that's how I'm going to construct the U. But of course, the, this by itself is a nonlinear problem, right? Because this is quadratic in derivative of U, and of course, it also depends on the metric. So when you actually solve the equations, the Einstein equations, you, you have to think about solving r alpha beta equal to zero, together with this one. These two are the fundamental building blocks in the construction of the, of the space time. You construct both this and this. And from these ones and from the t, you, you get the intersection. So the intersection that you see here, which I'm going to call STU. So these are two surfaces. And from here, I can construct the null frame. So once, once I have t and u, I have s t u, and then I have the null pair, e3 and e4, e1, e2, which I construct very easily. I mean, in, in this one, which is e4, is generated by u. So it's a, it's a null, the geodesic null vector field uh, associated to u. The other one, which is like this, I construct it based on this one and the fact that I already know this uh, derivative transversal to t equal constant. Okay, so this is dt. By symmetry. Right, so it's some kind of symmetry. I can construct the other one. So th from these two, I can construct the second one. Okay, so I, I get both e3 and e4 now. And then, of course, the e1, e2 are just tangent to these two surfaces. Right? So this is a frame. So this gives me the frame. I'm sorry? E3 plus E4 is DT. E3 plus E4 is essentially DT, correct. Yeah, I, I have to normalize it also a little bit, but, but it's in the direction of DT, correct. OK, so now, uh, now uh, uh, so this is my frame. So you see, once I have these two, I can define a frame, a null frame. Once I have the null frame, of course, I can define the gammas. And then I can, get, I can write down equations for the gamma equal to curvature. So somehow, the way to think about now is that, that I have two type of equations. I have equations at, at the level of the curvature itself and the equations at the level of, uh, of the gammas, right? So somehow, if I know the curvature, I can determine the gamma by just integrating these equations. So that's uh, sort of a big thing that needs to be done. But the first and the most important thing is to actually determine the curvature. And that's where the fact that the curvature that is of epsilon square invariant is going to be very important. So that, how, do you, how do you deal with the curvature? Uh, okay, so let me write it here. Okay, so the curvature is the crucial thing. And uh, there I have, to, I have to think about, so uh, we have the Bianchi identities dr equal to zero, and these other equations, which are divergence equal to zero, right? So these are, this, I can think of it as some kind of uh, Maxwell equation, right? It's more complicated because it has more indices, but it's similar to a Maxwell, it's formally similar to a Maxwell equation. So it's always satisfied that dr equals zero? Yeah, 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 so I if Ricci, is zero, then this is a Bianchi identities, and this one is a divergence, which is follows from this and this, right? So, so you get you get something which looks very much like the Maxwell equation. So the idea is actually to uh, do this as the Maxwell equation. So, in other words, I have to start taking lead derivative relative to vector. First of all, how do I define my vector fields, right? So it turns out that the vector fields can be defined using T, U, and the frame. So for example, I mean, just to give you an example, uh, if I want to define uh, this T, D, T, 
plus xi di as an example, I mean the analog of this. This will be uh, u times uh, uh, e3 plus uh, u bar times e4. Okay, where this one is constructing by u plus 2t. So if I have, in other words, if I have u and t, I can define this one. e3 I have, e4 I have, and u I have. And this is ex the exact analog of s, for example. Okay, so this is a kind of construction that I'm going to make. And I can define other vector fields like this, right? So I, I construct, in other words, I construct the vector fields uh, to be intimately tied to the, to the, these two functions and, and the connection associated with these two functions. The important thing is that you see you, there are only two functions, not four that I have there. I, I only need to construct two functions. And it's, mo it's a much more geometric construction because I know exactly what I construct and I know the reasons I construct. So t is maybe not so important, but clearly u is fundamental. Okay, so once, you, once you've done that, you now have the vector fields and you can start commuting, right? So you're going to get d of Lee x of r and uh, d of Lee x of r, uh, so this delta. But of course, here you are going to get pi's, complicated expression involving the pi and curvature, right? So this, uh, thi this is going to be, the, again, the hard part. Uh, all right, so now, uh, so the, the way to deal with this is in, in a first approximation you ignore. You assume that, that somehow you are like in, in flat space. You get estimates for the curvature, which are going to be energy type estimates. From it you get the decay rates using this kind of global Sobolev inequality that I mentioned earlier, something similar to that. So you get the decay rates for the curvature. So you, 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 you get the d various components of the curvature de decay at different rates. So for example, alpha will decay like uh, t to the minus 7 half, and uh, beta like t to the minus 7 half, and rho and so on. Alpha bar, which is the lowest component, decays only like t to the minus 1. So see, this is uh, exactly the alpha bar, if you remember, contains E3 twice E3. So in other words, this is a bad direction. E3 is a bad direction. For this reason, alpha bar is the worst component. Behaves only like T to the minus 1. T to the minus 1 is exactly the behavior of a solution of the wave equation. Right? So you cannot do better than this. this is, so alpha bar is what you observe when you do LIGO experiments. All the informations I carry carried by this because this decays very slowly. All the others decay too fast to see. So this is what you're going to see in, in, uh, in LIGO experiments, right? Because it's, it's a gravitational wave. I mean, obviously, it's a curvature that carries gravitational waves. OK, so that's, uh, so that's sort of the general philosophy. So now let me go through a little bit of, uh, right? So we have the gauge condition, which I explained, robust decay based on the vector field method to get decay for R. Construct approximate killing and conformal killing vector fields adapted to the foliation. And there has to be a null condition. So the null condition has something to do with the structure of this term. Because you are forced, because you, 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 you want to treat these terms here, you are forced to decompose everything. You, you, are, you have to look at the components of this, components of this, and hope that the worst possible decay rates that come from here and they come from here, uh, are such that uh, uh, it, they are not similar to what I mentioned earlier, this is 3 or 5 squared, right? You don't have to have, you don't, you have to avoid having components of this type. And if your geometric, if the construction is geometric, then you would avoid it. And indeed, my construction here is geometric, right? So that's sort of the general philosophy. Let me go a little bit more into this. Okay, so uh, this is a theorem. Uh, you construct this maximal foliation. You construct a null foliation by these null hypersurfaces. You construct an adaptive null frame, which are these ones, E4, E3, and the EAs, which are tangent to this intersection between T equal constant and U equal constant, so this foliation by two surfaces. These are compact two surfaces. So it's integrable. It's in, in this case, it's integrable, right. So it, because it's stability of Mikowski space, the expectation is that it's integral. If I do stability of care, I expect to get something which will be non-integral. Right? Right. So, uh, so you get STU, which are the intersections. Uh, you, get the, you define R to be the area radius 
of this uh, uh, SDU, right? Uh, sorry, is that something to do with what I do or not? <laughs> now I don't do anything, so it's probably not me, sorry. Okay, anyway, so, uh, okay, so you, you get uh, uh, R, you define R as a geometric, in a geometric way as being the area radius, connected with the area radius of these two surfaces. Uh, so R should be along null directions, R has to be like T, right? Because uh, you expect this null, you expect this uh, U equal constant to be similar to the T minus R equal constant in Minkowski space. But of course, there is a deviation here, but, but the deviation you hope is not too big. So in any case, T and R have to be comparable. And uh, here is what you get in terms of uh, R. Alpha behaves like R to the minus seven, seven half, seven half, R to the minus three, uh, rho star r to the minus seven half, r to the minus two, r to the minus one. This is the, the component that, again, that's the one that you see, it's being seen by LIGO. Uh, so, uh, so these are, this is called incomplete pinning because somehow Penrose had sort of an ad hoc way of, of deriving the, the decay estimates for the curvature, making certain assumptions, right? So based on certain assumptions, he was able to, to find much stronger decay. So he would find, for example, r to the minus 5 here, r to the minus 4, r to the minus 3, and so on. Uh, but in, in the stability of Minkowski space, we, we prove much less. But it seems to be much more consistent with what, it, what is actually going on. In fact, the, the, the strong peeling is, uh, is, is not generic. OK. Is a it's a, is this now hypersurface? No, I mean. Sigma, sigma, STU is a waveform, a time t. Yeah, so, so you, you have this CU here, right? So this is a null hypersurface, which corresponds to E equal constant. And then you have T equal constant. So, and then you have STU equal constant, which are these ones, the intersection. So these are the, if you want, yeah, these are the wavefronts. STU are the wavefronts, right? So, uh, okay, so that's the that's kind of uh, decay you get. This is again another picture, uh, initial data sigma zero, uh, t equal constant will be seen here. These are the null cons, which are here I call h, but uh, yeah, I, I call it c before, but these are the null cons. And these are the intersections, and you see there are some, uh, I mean obviously these are not spherical anymore because uh, the gravitational waves di di distorts the, the wave fronts. But this, uh, uh, this is how the space time reconstruct looks like. Uh, so the role of curvature, again, which I mentioned before, all null components of R relative to adaptive null frames stay within all of epsilon of the initial values. These are, uh, those do not depend on the frame, effectively gauge independent, and that's why you can analyze it by this uh, thing that I told you here. Uh, so this, this method, uh, which I mentioned here, will not unfortunately work when you do stability of black holes. And the reason is because not all components are four of epsilon square invariant. You, you get certain things which stay there forever, and therefore you, can, you are not going to be able to get decay in this way. You have to do something much more drastic. But in, in any case, in the case of the stability of Minkowski space, you, you have a uniform treatment of all components of curvature by using uh, a tensor uh, which is associated to this equation, which I just mentioned, right? These two here. Uh, I don't know why, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, this is a method of notation. I mean, this is not a very good notation. I should have delta r here. Uh, in any case, you can associate to this equation something which is called the Bell-Robinson tensor, which is a remarkable four tensor. which plays the role of an energy momentum tensor. So you see, if you talk about Maxwell equation, df equal to zero and df star equal to zero, then there is a, associated to this equation, there is a uh, energy momentum tensor, which is called T alpha beta, is uh, F alpha mu, F beta mu, plus the dual. So you can define the, the dual, so you get something completely symmetric. Okay, so this is maybe one half here. Th this is uh, the energy momentum tensor. And the energy momentum tensor has this remarkable property that we all know. This comes from Noether's theorem that uh, 
I mean, it's connected with not a theorem. It's that this divergence is equal to zero. So it's symmetric, and divergence is equal to zero. And once you have this, then you, the way you get conservation laws according to not a theorem is that you look at a vector field x, you take this contraction t alpha beta x beta, you get a one form, right? Because you have just this index. You take d, you take the divergence of this one form, right? And you get here, if d alpha falls on this, you get zero. If it falls on this, you get t alpha beta times, well, let me write it this way, t alpha beta. I'll put the indices up. t alpha beta d alpha x beta plus d beta x alpha. But because t, t is symmetric. Exactly. So I put a one half, and that's uh, the symmetry of t. And this is exactly the lead derivative of the metric G. Right? So if x is killing, you get zero here, and that gives you the conservation law by integration. You integrate, you get conservation law. Otherwise, uh, you have to take that into account. This is exactly the pi x. So in the, for the Einstein equation, there is something similar, but remarkable because it's not a two tensor, it's a four tensor. So there is the Bell-Robinson tensor T alpha beta gamma delta. So it's a four index tensor. And it looks like this. It's again maybe one half. There is an, an I, I'm not going to put all the indices. There will be a combination of indices R times R plus R star times R star in a correct way of, of uh, putting the indices. So you, you have two contractions, exactly. You have two contractions and you are left. So this is four, this is four, two contractions, and you are left with four. So this will be a four. A four it's fully symmetric. It's fully symmetric. And it's, uh, so this is for reach equal to zero. It's fully symmetric and uh, it's uh, traceless. So the, the trace uh, relative to any two indices is zero. And it verifies the divergence, so D alpha t alpha beta gamma delta is exactly identical equal to zero. So in other words, it plays the role of an energy momentum tensor, except that now, instead of taking just t alpha beta gamma delta, you, have th you can play with three things here. You can take x1 alpha, x2 beta, x3 gamma. And, uh, and then you do this, and again, you see the same thing because of the symmetries. You are going to see the, the, the pi, the deformation tensor of this vector field showing up on the right hand side. So in particular, if the, all of them are killing or conform a killing, you get a conservation law, right? Okay. Of course, you don't expect, for solutions of the Einstein equations, you don't expect to have killing, so you always have something on the right hand side. But this is what I wanted to say here, that uh, you can you can define energy, generalized energy estimates, just like we did for the wave equation. Uh, from which you get, once you have those uh, energy type estimates, you, you derive decay for each component of the curvature, you can derive the decay it has, right? Uh, so this is sort of the effective invariant way to treat the wave character of the Einstein vacuum equation. So again, this is remarkable because, uh, again, you don't need the fundamental solution. I mean, typically, Thibault is not here, but if we ask him, we see that that's what he does. He uses a fundamental solution, of course. Here you don't have to use a fundamental solution at all. It's a sort of a very robust way of deriving the decay and, of course, deriving energy estimates also. <laughs> okay, so finally, proof is based on a huge bootstrap uh, with three major steps. So, first of all, so it has to be a bootstrap because otherwise you can't do anything. So you start by making certain assumptions of, of, uh, of the curvature norms. So these are these invariant curvature norms that evolving these vector fields. You assume that they are bounded for all time. And from it, you get precise decay estimates of the connection coefficients of the TU foliation based on the equations which I wrote here. So which were uh, these ones, so D gamma plus gamma times gamma is R. So if I, if I have, if I make a bootstrap assumption, if I assume something about R, then I can derive estimates for the gammas. Once I have the estimates for the gammas, I can use uh, uh, I can use them to derive estimates for the deformation tensor of the scaling and the approximate scaling vector fields. Because, if, as you remember, these scaling vector fields are defined based on 
on the uh, the geometry of uh, of uh, of defoliation, and therefore based on the vector, uh, based on the frame, and based on the Ricci coefficients of the frame, and so on. And then once I have this, then I can go to this step. I can do this step, which is the most complicated one. I can do this step and show that indeed I can get bounds for the curvature. But of course, to do that, I have to control the error terms which are generated here, which uh, require lots of things, in particular decay for all components, but also requires, in addition, the null condition. If the null condition is not verified, I'm dead, right? Because uh, I will not be able to control these error terms. Just like in the wave equation, I recall, in the wave equation, if I have dt phi squared, and I, I, I try to implement my strategy, I will not be able to because this blows up, in fact. Right? So the same thing here, you, in order to work, you, you have to have this null condition satisfied, and fortunately it is. And uh, therefore, this is how you get bounds on the curvature, and therefore you can go back here and close the whole loop. Right? But of course, this unfortunately takes quite a, quite a while. The original proof, we had about 600 pages, I think now, well, maybe less, 5, 580. Uh, nowadays, of course, it can be done much faster. Right, so, so there are other proofs which are much faster. Uh, okay, there is another result uh, which I think of, would have been of interest to Thibault. I'm not sure, since he's not here, I'm not sure that it's worthwhile spending too much time. Uh, this is something that, uh, that uh, uh, a question that he was, I remember, interested from the very beginning when I met him. Uh, the, the thing was that uh, uh, this peeling, uh, these components of the curvature, which are r to the minus 7 half, r to the minus 2, and r to the minus 1, is not the peeling predicted by physicists before. They, they had this strong peeling, uh, which was predicted by Penrose, uh, or Bondi Sachs also. And uh, uh, so he, he wanted to know whether you can do better, whether you can get the full peeling. Anyway, so here, here I, I will mention very fast two results. So first of all, uh, a first result, which is with Nicolo in 2001, uh, which was the following thing. You start the same, it's the same thing as in stability of Minkowski space. So you start with six sigma zero GK, the same condition, the same I initial condition, but I don't assume any smallness. I don't make any smallest assumption, but instead I look at the uh, domain of, uh, of influence of or the future set of a sufficiently large compact set. So I take a large compact set on sigma zero, right? And uh, I, I look, I'm only interested in what happens outside. So here, if I have large data, of course I'm in the regime, regime of the final state when lots of things can happen here. Right? I can have extremely complicated things. So th this, uh, this result tells you that if you forget about this part, which obviously is going to be difficult, and you're interested only uh, sufficiently far from a, a compact set, then this behaves like in the stability of Minkowski space. In other words, the data now is going to be sufficiently small because of asymptotic flatness. Because asymptotic flatness means that things become small and small as you approach infinity. So things are going to be uh, sufficiently small, and therefore I, con I can construct my space-time all the way to the null hypersurface generated here. Right? So in other words, I cannot go beyond, but I can construct all the way to the null hypersurface. And this is based on a double null foliation. So the, the innovation here is that you don't use t, t equal constant anymore. Of course you couldn't because the maximality of t will make it impossible uh, because the, you know, make it impossible to use it just in this region. Right? T, um, something maximal has to be global. So it will have to go inside the region which you don't control. So you construct uh, only uh, something outside but instead of constructing with t equal constant, you construct with a double null foliation. So in other words, you take, in addition to this null cons, you take another family of light cons. So in other words, you replace t equal constant, you replace it by u bar equal constant, which is another family of null cons now moving in, which are now incoming, so moving in this direction. 
So in other words, I can, sorry, I can foliate this region like this, right? So, so I can, uh, the intersection, you see the intersection is still going to give me two surfaces, which are S U U bar. So instead of having S U T, as I had before, now I have S U U bar as uh, level surfaces. And I can do the analysis more or less in the same way. Okay, so the only innovation here is that it's, uh, it's what is called the double null foliation. So double null foliation is uh, given by two functions, u and u bar, verifying these equations. And otherwise, it's very similar, and the result is very similar. And finally, uh, the same power as before. yeah, so those, those will be the same power. But I make also the same assumptions in that result. But now, I can say more. So this is another result with Nicolo in 2003 where we show that if, you see, so it's, it's a matter of the, uh, of the assumptions on the initial data. If you remember, the assumptions were here, these ones. What does it mean, OK plus 1? OK, so let me explain. So I if you don't take any derivatives, it's just gij minus 1 plus 2m over r delta ij is all of r to the minus 2. So in other words, if I subtract, this is the Schwarzschild part. Yeah. If I subtract the Schwarzschild part from the metric, what I'm left to is are terms which decay like r to the minus 2, right? k plus 1 means I am also taking a certain number of derivatives. Every time I take a derivative of this, right, relative to the coordinates, because I, I have a coordinate system uh, in a neighborhood of infinity. It decays, the power of r. it decays better by power of r. It improves by power of r. And the same thing here. It improves by power of r. So now, uh, in here, uh, you see, I can, uh, so in this result, I make stronger assumptions. So if I take away the Schwarzschild part, then I can go all the way to r minus 3 half and plus a gamma. In other words, gamma is a parameter which allows me to make, to make stronger and stronger assumptions at infinity, right? So for example, if gamma is exactly 3 half, I get r to the minus 3 here. So I get much stronger decay than before. So I take the Schwarzschild, I get much stronger decay. So if, if gamma is larger than 3 over half, in other words, if the initial data is sufficiently, decay sufficiently fast, then I can get the, the Penrose peeling. In other words, r to the minus 5 for alpha and r to the minus 4 for beta. All right. But you see, this requires uh, this requires uh, a lot more decay, right? So it, it's somewhat non-generic. This was postulated by Penrose. So this is th this came from the analysis of Penrose. Yes, yeah, right. So Penrose uh, sort of assumed that a space-time can th this kind of space-time, which are asymptotic flat solution of the Ricci uh, flat equation, can be conformally compactified by adding a boundary at infinity. But this is an ad hoc assumption. I mean, uh, of course, it, it, it was never justified. In fact, it, it, nobody was able to justify uh, this conformal compactification picture. But the estimate is. But this estimate is still true, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you can do it, provided that you take enough decay, which it's not, yeah. I mean, the, the exact amount of decay is important in applications, but hey, that's, uh, and what is that's something should have been discussed with Thibault if he was here. And what is G and GS? Uh, that's a Schwarzschild part. Oh. So, G, so G is a, so you have G and K, yeah. right? And and I take G S uh, the Schwarzschild. In other words, it's one minus uh, one plus two m over r. Uh, and uh, then the what's left should decay fast. You cannot. You see, the because of the mass, the the positive mass theorem tells you that uh, uh, if m is equal to zero then, in fact, the G has to be exactly the Euclidean G, right? So if you are to have any non-trivial perturbations, they, they have to contain this one of our R terms. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's not right. So you always have to have this long range. Right. Long At infinity, you are close to, to Schwarzschild. At infinity, you are close to Schwarzschild. In fact, yeah, exactly, right. So in, in a certain sense, is also tied to stability of Schwarzschild, actually. Right. But Schwarzschild, of course, much more difficult. Uh, Anyway, so I think this, this is a good place to start. So ne next time, uh, which is just the last two, hour, two hours, I'll 
I'll really talk about this new result on uh, black hole stability with, um, with Jeremy, and uh, that will be that will be to show that uh, at least so the black hole stability <laughs> is much more difficult in the case of Schwarzschild than Kerr. The only thing which is known today is um, li in linear theory. So there are many interesting results in linear theory, uh, but nonlinear is much more difficult and. Uh, and uh, uh, the result I'll, I'll mention is the result on stability of Schwarzschild under restrictive perturbations. Uh, those restrictive perturbations are such that they constrain the final state to still be Schwarzschild. Because normally, if you perturb Schwarzschild, you will not stay in, in the Schwarzschild class. You'll go into a care with small a, with small rotations. You always generate some rotations unless you make some restrictions. So y the restrictions we make is just so that the final state is still, uh, is still Schwarzschild. But nevertheless, you have to take in, you still have to, to uh, work hard to adjust for the final mass, I mean, to, to track the final mass, because the final mass is going to be different, and to track for, to track for the gauge. I mean, you, you to find the dynamically the correct gauge in which you have decay. That's the hardest part, in fact. So with this, I'll stop.